already got some good questions coming in. <laughs> this is going to be a, a, a great crowd. So it's just after uh, three o'clock, it's 3.03 here uh, in Oakland, California. So why don't we get, get going? Um, so again, welcome everybody. Uh, we've got about 45 attendees uh, with us right now, um, and we had 115 RSVPs. So um, I think just to respect your time, let's get, let's get going and, and uh, hopefully some more folks will be joining us. So again, thank you all for being here uh, for our webinar on how to get ships off fossil fuels because this is a climate emergency. Um, I wanna start our webinar by acknowledging that the lands that I sit on today here in Oakland, California originally belonged to the Ohlone tribe. On Earth Day and every day, Pacific Environment encourages all of us to learn more about the histories of the lands uh, that we all live on. Um, if you haven't had a chance to uh, explore the history of, of your own land uh, from wherever it is that you're zooming in from today, we encourage you to do so. Um, and, and we're happy to provide resources if anyone has questions. Um, my second acknowledgement, um, I also wanna take a moment to thank all of the healthcare workers and other frontline workers on working on the coronavirus crisis um, for those of you that have family who may be ill um, or, or colleagues and friends who are working, we just want to say thank you and take note of the fact that all of us being able to be on this, on this webinar right now is in and of itself a privilege uh, to be together right now in safety. Um, third, we want to thank ClimateWorks for co-hosting today's webinar with us. Uh, ClimateWorks has been just an absolutely wonderful partner um, with Pacific Environment, uh, as have all the panelists. Um, in really uh, taking a leadership role in moving the shipping industry towards a 100% clean energy future. So thank you so much to Jason and the Climate Works team for co-hosting. Um, now I just have three quick housekeeping items I wanted to flag. So first, all attendees, if you have a question and answer box at any time, please send a question uh, that, will, that will come directly to me. I'll be organizing all of the questions for the moderated discussion at the end of our, of our panel. Um, second, the group-wide chat has been disabled, so don't go looking for it. <laughs> and third, um, this webinar will be rec recorded and made available. So if you do not want your name or affiliation referenced, um, if I ask your question, please just note that yeah, when, when you send a question my way. So with that, I'm going to give a, a brief overview uh, to set the stage as to why it matters to get ships off fossil fuels and what we all can do about it. First, the climate crisis is here and we need to decarbonize all critical industries. In front of you are just three of the dozens of headlines we've been seeing in the last just couple of weeks, warning of the severe damage being inflicted on our planet, our oceans and our collective health. The science is clear. We have just 10 years to significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions to stave off the worst impacts of climate change. In lieu of a global economy-wide policy solution like a carbon price being entered into force, what that means is that we have to decarbonize industry by industry. Second, greenhouse gas emissions from ships are a major driver of climate change and a threat to public health. As you see here, if shipping were a country, it would be the sixth largest emitter of climate change worldwide, ahead of the entire nation of Germany. Ships emissions also produce a number of other major pollutants that expose ship workers and port communities where the ships dock to toxic levels of air quality. And third, shipping is one of humans' oldest and most essential industrial innovations. This photo in front of you is of the Pesci Canoe, the world's oldest known ship, which dates back between 8,000 and 7,000 BC. It is obviously a zero emission ship. <laughs> Uh, while this slide is a bit facetious, it reminds us that the evolution of ships has both mirrored and defined the evolution of humans' industrial capabilities and ambitions. There is therefore no reason why we as a society cannot now create clean, efficient, zero emission vessels to power human society for the 21st century and beyond. Creating zero emission ships is feasible, critical, and it should be viewed as an exciting opportunity all of us on this call, whether you're a climate advocate, as a consumer of traded goods, an engineer, a technologist, we all must work together to demand of ourselves and of the shipping industry that we get ships off fossil fuels urgently and build clean ships for the future. Pacific Environment is campaigning to do just that. Um, and this webinar is part of our campaign uh, to decarbonize shipping. Uh, we have three main targets 
uh, in our campaign to decarbonize shipping. First is corporations, specifically major retailers who move their goods across our seas. The second campaign target is ports host the world ships at dock and therefore have a really interesting regulatory role to play. And third is national governments at the United Nations. Um, I'm happy to tell you all more about that campaign during our Q&A, but this webinar was designed to um, educate you to sort of uh, get you excited about the opportunity to decarbonize shipping um, and to, to join our campaigns in the months and years to come because this is going to be a long fight. So with that, um, I'm very excited to turn it over to Dr. Brian Comer, uh, a senior researcher with the International Council on Clean Transportation, who is a wonderful friend to the Pacific environment um, and just an absolutely lovely colleague. Uh, Dr. Comer will first walk us through the fuels and technology that industry uses today um, and outline for us the pathways uh, available to get clean. Great. Thanks very much, Madeline. Let me pull up my presentation here. Okay. Are we seeing just the presentation slide? No, the whole thing. Okay. Still the wrong one, is it? Yeah. No? All right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, I'd like to give you a crash course on transitioning to zero emission vessels. Today we'll be talking about the past, the present, and the future of zero emission vessels and shipping technologies and fuels. Starting with the past, uh, we went from wind to coal and then to diesel. I'll give you some examples on the following slides. Um, but I should also mention that um, as we as we started off with wind, even when we transitioned to fossil fuel technologies, even early on, uh, zero emission technologies like wind assisted propulsion and drag reduction um, have always been in the mix and are starting to become uh, part of the uh, transition now from where we are today to truly zero emission vessels. Beginning in the 15th century, all transoceanic shipping was accomplished with sailing vessels completely powered by the wind. So all ships were zero emission vessels. But starting in the 1800s with the advent of um, the steam engine, steam, steam powered ships that were fueled by coal began to be the norm. What you see on the screen is the SS Savannah, uh, the first uh, uh, steam ship Oh, sorry, that is the SS Great Western. That's the um, first ship to cross the Atlantic using just its coal-fired uh, boilers, but you'll see that the ship does still have uh, rigging for, for sails for wind assist. In the early 1900s, uh, with the uh, advent of the diesel engine, diesel-powered ships that could use liquid fuel, which saved a lot of space to be able to carry cargo, whereas before most of the um, of the space left on board was actually for carrying the coal that was going to be used to transport you, um, became much more popular starting in the early 1900s. And where are we today? Well, we're still using uh, fossil fuel technologies. The main technologies are heavy fuel oil with scrubbers, distillate fuels and blended fuels, which are a blend of the heavy fuel oil and the distillate fuels liquefied natural gas for a small but growing segment of the sector. And uh, on the water today, we are seeing small zero emission vessels, which I'll show you. All of these ships um, 
at some level are using drag reduction technologies and some are using wind assisted propulsion. On the right hand side of the screen, you'll see heavy fuel oil. Um, until recently, it was powering about 80% of the fuel consumption for the international shipping fleet. Starting in January of 2020, um, many ships have switched over to a blend of heavy fuel oil on the right and distillate fuel on the left called very low sulfur fuel oil. But ships have been using scrubber technology to remove this high sulfur content of the residual fuel and to continue burning the less expensive heavy fuel oil. Um, and um, we see that trend here. So um, starting in 2015 in so-called emission control areas, the maximum allowable sulfur content for marine fuels went from 1% sulfur to 0.1% sulfur. There's emission control areas around North America and also near Europe. And um, because it wasn't a global shift towards cleaner fuels, some ships choose, chose to install scrubbers to continue to use the high sulfur fuel and just remove the sulfur from their exhaust. Um, whereas others switched over to cleaner fuels while they were operating in emission control areas. But in January of 2020, the global fuel sulfur limit dropped from three and a half percent sulfur, which is 35,000 parts per million um, to five, uh, 5,000 parts per million, 0.5% sulfur fuel. And that drove a huge increase in scrubber installations uh, up to about 4,000 today of the roughly 50,000 large commercial vessels that we have um, in, the, in the global fleet. Scrubbers cut air pollution because they take in high sulfur exhaust and they um, spray seawater into the exhaust stack to remove the sulfur. Um, but as part of that, they're discharging what they're capturing overboard. The most common system are open loop scrubber systems, about 80% of the scrubber systems that are installed. And they take what they're capturing from the exhaust and dump it overboard. This is an example from Alaska in 2018 from a cruise ship. And you can see the um, yellow sulfur in the water and then also a grayish uh, sheen. This is from um, Alaska Ocean Ranger report. We also see um, a small but growing segment of ships using liquefied natural gas. So on the left hand side, uh, you see the trend from 2012 to uh, 2021. This includes the ships that are on order with a relatively large increase in recent years for container ships and especially for, uh, for cruise ships. Um, more than half of the cruise capacity that's on order today is expected to be powered with liquefied natural gas. Uh, liquefied natural gas emits less carbon dioxide emissions, but more greenhouse gas emissions. So on the right hand side, on the uh, left hand bar for each small segment, you're seeing the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions from LNG compared to the conventional marine fuels, marine gas oil, which is the distillate fuel, heavy fuel oil on the far right of the panel, and then the blended fuel, the very low sulfur fuel oil in the middle. The higher the bar, the worse the emissions. And for LNG fuel chips, um, a lot of the problem is with unburned methane escaping from the engine. And that's with the orange, orangish red part of the bar. Um, methane is a very strong global warming pollutant. It captures about 86 times more heat than um, the same amount of carbon dioxide over a 20 year time period. And some fossil fuel chips today are using wind assisted propulsion to reduce fuel consumption. And this technology can also reduce the total amount of energy that you need for a ship uh, which can help the transition to zero emission um, vessels because the, the low and zero emission fuels that you're going to need are going to be in relatively short supply and also more expensive. So anything that can be done today to reduce the amount of energy that it takes to move a ship is quite welcome and will enable a smoother transition to zero emission vessels in the future. We also have zero emission battery electric ferries. Uh, this is one in Norway that can carry 350 passengers. Um, it goes a very short distance, but there's been um, a huge increase in research and development into batteries 
And we're now actually expecting batteries to be part of the solution, even for ocean going vessels in hybrid and fuel cell uh, applications. We also have hydrogen ferries on the water today. On the left is a, a small passenger ferry that burns hydrogen in an internal combustion engine. And on the right hand side is an 86 passenger hydrogen fuel cell ferry, which is expected to launch later this year in San Francisco called the Water Go Round. And the future, um, we're seeing increased interest in biofuels, ammonia, battery powered cargo ships or battery hybrid power um, powered cargo ships and also hydrogen cargo ships. All of these will be um, also using drag reduction technologies like um, slippery hull paint and uh, some of them will be using wind assisted technologies. With biofuels, the ICCT is going to publish a life cycle greenhouse gas assessment similar to what we did for liquefied natural gas in the coming months. So uh, stay tuned for that. My contact information is on the last slide and we're gonna share these. Um, so feel free to reach out um, if you're interested in that research. On the right hand side is a comparison between total energy de demand by a sector. The marine sector is on the far right hand side and the total en energy demand in 2050, we expect it to be 20 exajoules and uh, we expect truly sustainable bioenergy to be able to at most um, supply about um, five exajoules. So um, there's a mix mismatch between supply and demand and also um, not to say anything about the price of the fuel compared to uh, fossil fuels. And as we're seeing today um, with oil prices plummeting that has knock on effects for fuel prices for the shipping industry as well. Um, so the, the cleaner technologies really are at a disadvantage currently um, compared to fossil fuels. We're also seeing interest in ammonia. Primarily the interest here, uh, it could be used as a hydrogen carrier for a fuel cell, which would then make it a zero emission fuel. But um, primarily what we're seeing is interest in burning it actually in internal combustion engines. Now, um, Ammonia is a zero carbon fuel, it's NH3, uh, so there's no carbon, but it's not necessarily a zero emission fuel. So we're concerned about nitrogen oxide emissions by burning um, ammonia in a marine engine, which is an air pollutant, and then nitrous oxide emissions. Um, I mentioned that methane is 86 times better at capturing heat than carbon dioxide over a 20 year period nitrous oxide is um, over 250 times. So even a small amount of nitrous oxide uh, being emitted from these ships could be a substantial problem and be counterproductive. So we're interested to look at the new research that's coming out by the engine manufacturers on emissions from burning ammonia in the internal combustion engine, which we is expecting, we're expecting um, more and more interest in this technology. Um, I should mention that the ammonia also needs to be produced from renewable energy to be green. Most of it's, uh, you know, over 95% of it today is produced from fossil fuels. So uh, supply issue there as well. A um, couple more slides. Um, we have battery electric cargo ships on the horizon. The Yara Birkeland in Norway is expected to launch uh, this year. And there's also on the water already a battery electric 2000 ton capacity bulk carrier. Uh, irony of all ironies, it's uh, transporting coal for a coal fired power plant. And um, our most recent research on zero emission vessels is can you power the Trans Pacific container trade just with hydrogen fuel cells? We found that uh, based on ship traffic that we're seeing today, the types and sizes of ships that we're seeing today on this trade that yes, you can um, with either no modifications at all or with um, adding an extra port call to refuel on hydrogen or replacing a small amount of the cargo space with additional fuel capacity. Container ships have huge engines. Uh, some of them are 100,000 horsepower. Uh, many of them are up to 60 megawatts, about 75, 80,000 horsepower. Uh, so getting a fuel cell array in, uh, in a ship to be able to provide that power will be 
a challenge, but we're seeing some movement on this with uh, a Swiss engineering company, ABB, manufacturing um, a more than one megawatt hydrogen fuel cell system for a proof of concept that it can be incorporated into a large container ship. Um, and uh, we're expecting that if you can combine it um, with additional energy saving technologies like wind assists or um, drag reduction or advanced ship designs, uh, that it makes the transition even easier. So that's where we've, uh, we've been, where we are and where we're headed to. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Uh, my contact information and acknowledgements are available for you on this slide and I'll turn it back to Madeline. Thanks so much, Brian. Um, again, just thinking about the, the potential of, of all these new innovations that are on the horizon and the decade to come is really what's, I think, so inspiring about and exciting about this campaign uh, to see that some of those pictures towards the end. So thank you so much. Um, so now we're going to turn it over to Dan Hubble. Um, Dan uh, is our dear friend at the Ocean Conservancy, and he's going to walk us through the role of citizen advocacy in making this transition happen uh, within the decade to come to stay safely within the limit. I also have to embarrass Dan by saying it's his birthday today and he's taking an hour out with us to not be doing fun things. Um, so obviously this is fun. Um, so happy birthday to Dan on behalf of our uh, attendees and take it over. Well, uh, thank you for that, Madeline. I, uh, <laughs> uh, is, is that uh, working on the screen for everyone? Uh, very good. Uh, so as Madeline said, uh, my name is Daniel Hubble. Uh, I'm the Shipping Emissions Campaign Manager for Ocean Conservancy. Uh, and I, I thought I'd like to talk a little bit about the uh, US specific angle and, and many of the things that, that citizens should, uh, could and should advocate for uh, as we look to make some changes on, of our own to actually bring into reality a lot of the, the technologies that Brian highlighted as, as a zero emissions future for this industry. Uh, so just to hone in a little bit on the United States itself, uh, shipping carries approximately 90% uh, of world trade by volume uh, and is one of the largest econo uh, economies on the planet. The United States is, of course, a key driver in this. Uh, by one estimate, I, I've seen uh, we're something at 8% of all trade on our own. Uh, this is, of course, reflected in our, our uh, shipping capacity itself. Uh, accounting for ships from all flags, uh, since a lot of ships are registered in uh, overseas countries or territories, uh, international shipping to and from U.S. ports, uh, is significant and accounts for about 38.9 uh, million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. Uh, that's about 4% uh, of the sector's total in 2015. Uh, it's gone up slightly since this point, but I, I don't have a good reference point uh, with the IMO to compare it to. So just to sort of keep that in mind, uh, it's a considerable portion and it's a portion that is having an immediate effect on communities within the local area as well. Uh, ship pollution can and and does have significant health impacts as well. Um, for communities near ports that make this uh, a key environmental justice issue in a lot of cases. So that's also, I think, a really good place for us to start about uh, one of the key pieces of action that's uh, driven a lot of effort at ports to date. Uh, and that has been the air, air pollution component of it. Many ports, uh, including LA and Long Beach, have uh, created air pollution plans to try and address uh, some of the impacts from their own facilities and from ships. Uh, and one of the key solutions that folks have honed in on uh, has been the option for onshore power and electrification. So this is using, uh, this is allowing the ship to plug into the grid uh, directly rather than using its own engines when it's in port. Uh, in According to the EPA in 2017, this can cut air pollution down by 98% and has considerable uh, carbon emission savings as well. Of course, uh, as Brian notes with ammonia, another challenge with this is uh, the savings when it comes to carbon can vary quite a bit depending on what we're actually getting out of the grid in the area. So investment in renewable energy onshore is just as essential as ever when it comes to how we handle emissions offshore as well. Uh, at present, uh, onshore power is available in between 20 and 30 ports, and the impact it can have is significant. Uh, by one estimate, uh, Seattle has, has onshore power for uh, Pier 91, which is specifically used for cruise ships. And each time a ship docked and utilized the onshore power that saved the equivalent of 30 cars traveling cross country from Seattle to New York. And that's maybe not the, the most fine uh, way of example of uh, ex illustrating the problem in terms of numbers, but I love it as a, as a very illustrative sort of uh, convoy cross country that we can avert. Uh, 
that kind of innovative thinking is also something we need to work on uh, scaling up. I think a lot of the, the leaders when it comes to uh, cutting emissions in the United States are uh, the port of Seattle, Tacoma, uh, the ports of LA and Long Beach, and of course the New York Port Authority, all of which are members of what's called the World Ports uh, Climate Action Program. Uh, and while, like many things, their original plan to meet this year, I think, has been somewhat derailed by COVID, a lot of the areas that they were going to focus on in their work and, and by all accounts, intend to continue to do so was on exploring zero emission uh, vessels and bunkering options, uh, providing new ways to reduce emissions in their own facilities and for ships uh, and other alternatives to gain efficiencies like digital technology. Uh, that kind of first mover initiative is something we'd love to see replicated at other ports uh, around the country. Uh, there's a whole hodgepodge of uh, public and private port facilities that would need to be incorporated and, and have a chance to really take action. Uh, another key component is that while the federal government has signaled its intentions to leave the Paris Agreement, uh, the spirit of Paris does live on uh, in the context of the uh, We Are Still In Coalition, which uh, at least 10 states and 289 municipalities have joined. And that does include four of the five largest ports in the United States, uh, the four I listed before. Uh, we're missing some like Savannah or uh, the ports in Virginia, but this is uh, definitely an area where a lot of uh, advocates at the state level could step up and, and urge their airports to actually reflect not only their emissions from shipping, but their impacts locally. Uh, and that segues us rather nicely into talking about what we could be doing at the federal level. Uh, the immediate first big step, of course, would be for the United States to uh, support strong short-term action uh, on climate change within the International Maritime Organization. And uh, I think, think we're missing a bit of the framing that I, I might have needed to get into that, but right now uh, the IMO is still debating uh, short-term actions that would be adopted before 2023 that could help cut the emissions for ships on the water today, in addition to actually setting the stage for how we meet uh, more middle and long-term goals. Uh, and a big key component for that would just simply having and the United States actually participate and support a more progressive calls to action that can actually get us on the right track for total decarbonization by 2050. Uh, a next component would be uh, infrastructure grants. Uh, and this is something we've heard time and again from uh, every port or that's uh, currently taking action is that uh, in things like onshore power are uh, potentially expensive and a lot of the investment that needs to come up front, uh, the federal government can play a really key role in actually driving that, that initiative. We have a lot of the right uh, labs and innovation in the United States to really be leaders in this field. And we should definitely look at, it as a, look at it as an opportunity. If a vessel leaves China powered by hydrogen, as uh, Brian notes earlier, they need to be able to bunker in the United States when they get here. And actually providing those facilities is a key uh, piece of infrastructure that we could start putting into the ground uh, pretty much as soon as possible. Uh, so much for actually getting us down the road and to actually address the 38.9 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent we're working on right now, uh, a key first step would be in installing a monitoring review and verification scheme for shipping here in the United States or MRV. Uh, there is one of these models in Europe, which allows for a public and transparent uh, disclosure of a lot of information connected to fuel consumption and uh, cargo and the routes used that allow our regulators to really hone in on, on how we can best uh, tackle this issue. Uh, while there is a more international scheme within IMO, uh, a few extra components like transparency and cargo, if handled right, could, uh, I think, be implemented well without being too redundant on other systems. Uh, another area would be exploring speed reductions. Uh, and I don't mean to step too much on where Jason may be going and what our solutions look like, uh, but reducing speed by 20% can cut a ship's emissions by up to 34%. And that has knock-on effects on underwater noise as well. And depending on uh, the speed reduction could even uh, avert fatal ship strikes for whales. Uh, obviously, these are lots of ecosystem benefits that in many cases the United States is trying to address already with uh, animals like North Atlantic rights uh, off the eastern coast of the United States or, or in near the ports of LA and Long Beach. And this is a similar concern along the shipping routes there. Uh, finally, another uh, component that could be explored is a federal fuel tax to finance a lot of this R&D and expenditure. Um, this would probably take a form within the United States itself and actually uh, allow us to really put the power of our purse uh, to work by tackling a lot of the companies that would be doing business here. Uh, and speaking of companies, this is, uh, I think, a final an uh, uh, angle to take on at the end. And this is Americans are consumers, and this is a chance for us to really vote with our wallets and actually uh, call to action. And I'm going to cite one specific example from Ocean Conservancy and one example 
uh, that we have nothing to do with, but I, I would love to support it regardless. Uh, and last year in October 2019, we launched the Arctic sh uh, Shipping Corporate Pledge with Nike. Uh, today, it's got 22 additional signatories, including uh, three of the largest shipping companies uh, by volume, uh, CMA CGM, uh, Hapag Lloyd, uh, and MSC, as well as large uh, fashion and retailers like Ralph Lauren or H&M. Uh, while this was primarily directed at uh, targeting or about uh, directing ships away from shipping through the Arctic as a transshipment route, it's important for, uh, for this conversation to note that we wouldn't be talking about such routes if it wasn't for uh, climate change sort of raising their profile as a potential shortcut from one market to another, something that just puts all the rest on local communities and Arctic ecosystems with, with little benefit. And a key component of actually addressing that beyond just pledging not to go that way was a commitment by these companies to actually look at ways to reduce energy uh, consumption and, and carbon emissions in their own uh, supply chains as well, which I, I think is sort of a key holistic approach that we definitely support. Uh, and the link here, as you can see, is actually for the citizen component as well. So if you'd like something to take action and join in right as soon as you're done, if you're really jazzed after we're all, all off the Zoom call today, uh, the link will be going around in the PDF and we'd love to have you on board. Uh, and then finally, just to give a shout out to Getting to Zero, because I think that's been a, a major initiative within the, within the corporate world that's brought together uh, over 70 industry leaders across sectors, including uh, energy, shipping, as well as uh, finance, financing to, with the goal of getting a deep sea zero emission vehicle on the water by 2030. And I think uh, as the United States, our goal will be to ensure that it can fuel up when it gets here. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, I believe, Madeline. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, and yes, we will be sending out the link uh, for the, the Take Action Pledge, and we were, are going to be expanding that campaign in the months to come. Um, so definitely keep an eye on, on the, the corporate uh, opportunity space. Um, I just want to remind folks before we go to our last panelist, please do send in your questions and answers your questions so that we can answer them. Uh, we've got a couple coming in, uh, but definitely I think a few more we can take. So don't be shy and, and send your questions over. Um, so I'm very, very excited to introduce our last panelist, Jason Anderson, who really needs no introduction in this community. Um, but he is going to really take us home from here and say, you know, show us why now? Um, why do we believe that pressure on the shipping industry can win? What are the wins that we've had? And what is the next decade really looking like from uh, a funder's perspective, but also really from a, 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 a movers and shakers perspective on, on this industry. So Jason, uh, over to you. Thanks a lot, Madeline. Uh, really uh, appreciate the opportunity to be on this panel uh, with Brian and Dan, and I'm glad that you're all joining us this afternoon. I'm gonna talk about cleaning up shipping, and there are a lot of reasons for us to be optimistic, as I think you've heard some of them. Um, I'm not quite as optimistic that ships will ever be as pretty as, as this one in Copenhagen, but you know we can see what we can do about it. Um, let's talk about the short and the long-term problem. The, the long-term problem is that a lot of these, uh, a lot of these energy using uh, applications, uh, are, they're long lived, meaning that right through the point where we're supposed to get down to about zero net, net carbon in the world in 2050, um, they will continue to, to, to be operational. And transport options like cars and trucks are often considered to have quicker turnover. But uh, if you look at ships, they can have a, a lifespan that is 20, 30, 40 years, depending on the application. So essentially any ship that's entering service will at some point need to be zero carbon in its lifetime. And it's not just the ship, it's you've got to be able to have zero carbon fuels delivered to that ship at a port somewhere. And it has to be affordable or incentivized or mandated or some combination of those things. And we have to bear in mind that shipping is an intrinsic part of global trade. So we have to be careful about how that's done. And there are a lot of countries, developing countries at the end of long trade routes that we have to be sensitive to how they are brought along in this story as well. So there's quite a, a puzzle to bring together. If we look at the reductions trajectory for greenhouse gases that we need, it's uh, also pretty daunting. Business as usual is a big rise as estimated by the IMO. We can get a lot of the way there uh, with uh, energy efficiency measures. Brian has pointed out some of those, but to get to the IMO's goal of cutting emissions by half, at least half by 2050, it's a really big reduction. But then our goal 
which is consistent with a well below two, tra two degree trajectory is to get to carbon neutrality by 2050. So you can see that there's a big kink at 2020 where we have to really be going down. It's a, it's a very big goal. On the other hand, there are reasons for optimism. I mean, we've seen successes that people working on the shipping have had in the past. Uh, energy efficiency standards, uh, the EEDI, <coughs> passed by the International Maritime Organization. They're not the most stringent standards at the moment, but they can be ratcheted down. The, the low sulfur fuel regulations that Brian mentioned were fought hard against by many in the industry, but they're in place now in 2020 and could save tens of thousands of lives while essentially representing a carbon tax because of the, the increased uh, price of the fuel. I mentioned the, the IMO's plan to cut by at least 50% uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Well, that's not enough, but it's a lot farther than the IMO used to be. Basically, until the Paris Climate Agreement in 2015, it was like ships are not as bad as airplanes, so we're okay. And we've come a long way since then, and everyone from NGOs to industry are also looking at going much farther. We have this pending ban on heavy fuel oil, the sludge-like uh, fuel in the Arctic. We have emissions control areas around the world that are contemplating uh, increasing that, uh, the range of that to the Mediterranean Sea, maybe to going to all of China. We have action in uh, ship finance through the Poseidon principles, which partners have uh, helped catalyze. And we've seen real changes in industry. Uh, cruise lines going hybrid, the world's largest container shipping country, uh, company, uh, Marisk, having a carbon neutral commitment. And as Dan just mentioned, the Global Maritime Forum together with the World Economic Forum, um, Friends of Ocean Action have got together into the Getting to Zero Coalition, which unites companies from across the whole value chain to talk about getting zero carbon ships on the water by 2030, which is an ambitious goal. Now, shipping is largely one of those things for the general public is sort of out of sight and out of mind. People don't think about it so much, but you do notice it if you're in a port city that has uh, heavy pollution from ships. And partners of ours, when they go around the world with handheld hand -held monitors, like the one you see in the, in the bottom left here, a piece of that, they discover that, for example, if you're on the exercise deck of a cruise ship, you're actually exposed to more pollution than on the worst days uh, in New Delhi. You know, so that kind of thing really is making headlines around the world. And it's where people with environmental justice concerns and health concerns are, are, are cluing into the shipping problem and where there's a lot that we need to do on pollution. The greenhouse gas uh, solution, getting to zero carbon fuels is a, is a more, more challenging proposition in the long term. Um, but, you know, I wanna make the argument that in theory, there are ways in which it maybe ought to be a relatively simple in the sense that new fuels like ammonia uh, can use today's engines to start off with in a blended way and you know, the, there are some modifications. One company, MAN in Denmark, makes almost half of all of these engines and they're working on all of these. It's less of a stretch going from an internal combustion engine to, a, to an electric car, for example, uh, in, in these types of engines. 10 liner companies like Maersk are most of the global operators. 10 charters are most of the bulk carriers. Three uh, countries, uh, Japan, South Korea, and China make most of the ships. Three ports, Singapore, Rotterdam, and Fujairah in the United Arab Emirates sell most of the fuel. And there is a global regulator, the IMO. So these represent potential leverage points, which make you think that you could potentially have the opportunity to make big changes in relatively short order if we can get them teed up. That said, you can't do everything all at once and we need some steps to get there. So we need to be able to have a regulatory approach and a market approach, but before we can get to either of those, we need pre-regulatory demand. So where there's the right conditions to get new technologies off the ground. Um, <coughs> places with potentially cheap renewable energy uh, where it's very sunny or very windy and uh, that can that can help you create hydrogen or ammonia on the left you see uh, a graphic from a report by by edf which uh, indicates that places like chile or morocco which are off the beaten track for the fossil fuel supplies can become new suppliers of new types of renewable fuels by using these uh, the access that they have to wind and solar there are some places that are, you know, brave governments willing to put up some local subsidies to get the ball rolling where they are, or there's public pressure. And there are also places where the market is just willing to pay more. And Brian showed a picture of a battery electric ferry in Norway. 
people I know who've been on them say they're fantastic because you're in these scenic areas. You're not belching smoke into the fjord. Uh, it's quiet. People love them, and they're really starting to take off, and there are orders coming in from around the world, including in the northwest of North America. Uh, but then you do need to be able to, to get the market moving with regulation or the credible threat thereof to, to help uptake electricity and clean fuels, and also to supply uh, finance that will allow the industry to, to make the necessary changes. On your way, you're developing the market, but that market needs to be more sophisticated. We need to price in the kinds of co-benefits like reduced air pollution, and we have to think about new business models. So for example, in ports, lots of things come together. Uh, electricity can create renewable fuels. Those fuels can be turned back into electricity. You've got ships, you've got trucks, you have equipment. Uh, you have industry zones and trying to take that all together can create a new model for how we can use these fuels. We see multiple priorities that we divide into three basic areas, policy, corporate and technology. So as mentioned, the IMO uh, has a lot of leverage and it needs to be looking at the short, medium and long term. And in the short term, you know, if you slow ships down, it saves a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. But we're still working on how we might have something like levies or a carbon market, things that raise revenue, that provide an incentive to switch to clean fuels. But regions like Europe are pushing forward with including shipping in the emissions trading system, which is a very important step at that level that could be a stepping stone to, to a global approach. And we see these uh, emission control areas, which not only are good for limiting pollution, they are an incentive to think about what the alternatives would be and if there's an opportunity to switch to something that's beneficial for reducing carbon pollution as well. On the corporate side, getting to zero is a great initiative, um, but we need to make sure that we're seeing stepping stones to getting to that end goal that they've already stated and to help facilitate the, the development that they want. And part of that could come from creating demand from retailers who uh, may have green commitments, but perhaps haven't thought about the shipping component, how far we can get that signal out to the shippers themselves. Then there are the public campaigns that can be the kind of pressure that you need to see. For example, our friends there at Stand uh, telling Carnival how to uh, clean up their act there and uh, works hand in hand uh, with, with the more cooperative approaches with corporations. In terms of technology, as I mentioned, we've got to see more ships on the water. It's, uh, the, the technologies are not as well developed as they need to be in order to be able to give confidence to both uh, regulators and to the industry that we can move forward at, a, at the pace we need to. And an important area here could be ports where all of this stuff comes together and uh, has also the uh, local air uh, quality considerations. And we can do, among other things, really activating the shipbuilders because they're so concentrated and looking at where the opportunities are for new, new markets for them. Even though all of this is a daunting list of things that we need to work on, uh, I'm really encouraged that uh, in the 11 years that Climate Works has been working in this sector, never before have we had so many uh, partners and allies working together, so capable around the world and bringing a lot of uh, energy and intelligence to this issue. And that's why, as I say, I'm really pretty optimistic that we'll be able to uh, get where we need to go in decarbonizing shipping. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Jason. Um, the, the fun of this, of this career and of this space is that we really are working with the optimists, the folks that are, you know, that are looking 10, 20, 30 years down the line. And that's really um, a privilege and, and, a, and a pleasure. Um, so thank, thank you all so much. Um, we've got a great lineup of questions. So uh, folks, if you haven't sent your questions in, please do. Um, so the first question I'm gonna direct to Dr. Comer, which the question was, are there upstream and emissions concerns with hydrogen? Um, Brian, do you want to take that? Thanks, Jess. Uh, I mentioned them with, um, with ammonia. Like ammonia, the, the source of the hydrogen is important, so it needs to be from renewable sources like wind or solar. Right now, over 95% of hydrogen is made from fossil fuels, um, so that wouldn't qualify as a low carbon or low emission fuel. Um, but from downstream, if you combust it, or more likely if you use it in a fuel cell, there's um, no pollution emissions to be, to be found. Um, you get heat and water vapor, and so we consider it uh, truly a zero emission fuel downstream. Thanks, Brian. Um, so a big and great question uh, we got as well was, if you had to choose, 
what are three of the biggest opportunities for private philanthropy to make in reducing emissions at scale within the next three years? Um, Jason, do you want to take that first? So I think all of us might, might want to weigh in. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just re reiterate those three areas that I mentioned, uh, policy, corporate, and technology. And those are all areas where there are many opportunities. I listed just three under each bullet point. Um, when we looked at this with our partners, we had 55 different opportunities across all three of those. So there's a lot to be done. In, in policy, there are debates going on right now about what to do to, to get immediate benefits um, from slowing ships down and starting to explore things like how you can raise revenue through a levy that can be reinvested. And believe me, these, um, although they seem like kind of abstract, you know, UN entities, the people on this call and other people are in there and their voice is heard and it really has a big influence on the outcomes to these events. The, the low sulfur shipping rule that came into, um, into place this year, we can trace the decision to carry that out directly back to work that our partners did uh, in the halls of the IMO. Um, in the corporate area, there are campaigns that are just getting off the ground now, as I mentioned, and, and Madeline referred to in getting the retailers involved, people who already have a green profile or green commitments. And because we know that the shipping industry is interested, but they need to see not just the technology demanded, but also the, the, the customer, demand, customer demand. And, and that's just starting to come together. And then on the technology side, there are lots of things going on around the world. I would say that action in ports is a really great thing that we could we could pull together. There's um, I'm looking out my window right now and I see the port of Oakland where there's a, a new project uh, to try to clean it up for local air pollution, but also to use excess fuels that they have there, trying to switch to hydrogen and electricity. That is really on the cusp and, and can take off. Dan or Brian, do you want to jump in? Um, yeah, so I, I could just add that um, while it's really important to be able to have a strong technology pathway, which is primarily what I was presenting on today, um, because of because the negative externalities of using fossil fuels are hardly ever um, built into the price of the fuel, and because even with a, a carbon price, the amount that you would have to charge to make the renewable energies competitive is is extreme. There's a real need for um, policy action and not just setting ambitions, but setting mandatory legally binding um, measures that have to be met and have to be done to um, improve energy efficiency for ships, to drive uh, a transition to zero emission vessels from the policy side, um, because the economics in the market itself are not enough to, to really drive that transition. And we're actually quite lucky in the international maritime um, transportation sector that we have a, a treaty that the International Maritime Organization can work with. So when member states come to the International Maritime Organization, it's uh, a specialized agency of the United Nations. There's an international treaty on pollution from ships, and there's a specific part on air pollution and climate pollution. And so once IMO member states agree to take an action or agree to a policy, uh, it becomes legally binding on pretty much every country um, in the world, and certainly all the ones that are um, that have an interest in international shipping, including the United States and Canada. So um, we actually do have the ability to get policies in place that are legally binding on um, the global industry. So that's that's actually quite nice. Quite nice indeed. <laughs> uh, Dan, you want to add? Yeah, uh, just to echo everything uh, Jason and Brian said, but to note also, this is really the time to do so. Uh, at least in the run up to 2023, the IMO is still debating a lot of short term actions. And, and this is an industry that by the nature of the investment does need to look carefully before it leaps. Uh, and a lot of a lot of research needs are still out there to sort of understand or to help them understand where the best place to leap is going to be. Beyond that, in 2023, there is an option to potentially ratchet or improve a lot of the targets that we're setting here and, and to really demonstrate real ambition. Uh, two of the largest carriers have already announced that they've uh, hit the goal IMO set for 2030. And while that's really commendable and a great first step on energy efficiency gains, it also indicates that 
maybe we could be thinking more ambitious down the road here, uh, especially in the mid and long term. Thanks, Dan. And just, just to crystallize that point from the Pacific environment perspective, I would say in the next three years, we really have an opportunity to mount aggressive public campaigns that organize port communities and organize the environmental community to specifically make these changes. Um, I'm, I'm coming into the shipping community new and I'll say there's a, there's a real power here for, for influence because it is a relatively underfollowed sector. Um, they're not used to, the shipping industry isn't used to the level of public scrutiny that other industries have faced. But what we have the opportunity to do is to sort of do what was done for electric vehicles, right? To demand that, that the sector make this transition. So there is a familiarity in the public imagination to, to what this campaigning looks like. And we just haven't invited the public to engage in shipping. So that organizing, that narrative change, that campaigning work, um, uh, I think there's, there's really an opportune moment to scale that up in the next three years. So um, Brian mentioned uh, uh, binding legislation, which takes us to a good second question or next question that came up, which was how will these initiatives and efforts advance um, if uh, the current administration uh, continues uh, in the United States? Um, noting that if we only have 10 years, what can be done if there is a second term uh, of this current administration, which has not been very po uh, positive or supportive towards uh, climate mitigation. I'll, I'll, I'll tip that to Dan, but just to start, you know, I'm, I'm, I come from a congressional background and I think we really have an opportunity to make the argument that there, um, it, that there's a, a geopolitical competition here, right? As Jason mentioned, the three biggest shipbuilding countries are South Korea, China, and Japan. And if the United States government does not prepare American maritime industry and does not prepare our ports to stay competitive, um, you know, American industry loses uh, in addition to the environmental hazards. But there, there is just a very real um, economic competitiveness argument that should be nonpartisan. And when I talk about, you know, reindustrialization policy, um, that, that, that there shouldn't be a partisan split there. Of course, that's a bit of, you know, should and, and is, 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 is difficult. But the other piece I would say is that that's why we are focusing a lot of our energies on advocacy at ports and at the state level. Unfortunately, states don't have as much funding um, and these shore power, there are a lot of questions about shore power. Um, you know, it, it, the challenge is that they're, it's expensive. So some of these infrastructure projects are expensive, but uh, there are a lot of, there's a lot of leadership at the state. There's a lot of leadership at the ports, the ports of Seattle, the port of Los Angeles, port of Oakland. Um, so there is an opportunity to do a lot of good work, um, even in lieu of, of lack of federal support. Uh, Dan, do you want to add? Sure. Uh, and, and this is just a maybe pile on to a, a couple of points, but on its own, LA and Long Beach collectively represent 32% of the imports uh, by container or of containers into this country on its own. And I, I think that really does indicate that decisions made at individual ports, like they're a collective decision to aim for net zero by 2050 has a huge impact on its own. And, and again, that's the kind of thing that, again, should be replicated, should be shared. Uh, we don't have any Gulf state ports taking the, those kinds of leaps to the same degree. Uh, but when we talk about that kind of action, that can go on regardless of who's in the White House. Um, I think a connected point to it, though, is that this, this is something that I think, even at the congressional level, there's a lot of really interested um, questions going on right now, and not necessarily in a in a fully partisan way either. There was a hearing back in January hosted by uh, the IMO subcommittee on maritime transport and the Coast Guard, and uh, some things I found really interesting about it was that this was uh, it was a really wonderful uh, and well and very constructive pan uh, hearing with a lot of questions about uh, technology uh, innovations, where what the role of the United States could be in it, and it it felt. I feel like, at least within the congressional sphere, this is something that would probably continue regardless. Thank you. All right, well, we are uh, down to four minutes. So we are gonna close with one question, um, uh, one final question, and then we will close. For, for those folks who didn't get your questions answered, we'll make sure to get you written responses um, and, and include them in the follow-up email coming tomorrow. So our last question uh, was, you know, what is the impact of the coronavirus? on the ability to get chips off fossil fuels in the timeline that we've articulated. Um, any of my panelists wanna take that one? I, I, I guess I could uh, take a first crack at it. Uh, obviously, we, I, I think it's 
it's a challenging time for everybody in the immediate and short term. And that's it's not to understate the, the images of containers piling up at docks and going unclaimed and, and a lot of the challenges that are faced all across the supply chain. Um, but as, as this is definitely a, a long-term challenge with a long-term view, uh, the IMO itself actually indicated that they intend to, to stick to stay the course on the targets that have been set. And uh, again, the announcement by Hapak Lloyd was literally earlier today that they'd hit that 2030 target. And Maersk has similarly indicated that they're trying to stay the course in their climate goals. Uh, it's a lot of challenges in, in, up front, but I don't uh, see it derailing where we're going. And I, I certainly hope it doesn't. And I certainly hope we, we can get on track with our partners as, as soon as we can. Yeah, I think, um, I think the same. Um, I, I mean, one thing that we've learned throughout this whole pandemic is that um, there's been a lot of attention on cruise ships um, and rightfully so, um, but there's been less attention paid to the seafarers and there's over a million seafarers that are on the water every day. And they've been in some really um, dire straits recently with restrictions on crew changes and restrictions on coming ashore. And so there's a real human impact here, uh, especially in the near term. Um, so I, I, I want to make sure that we don't forget that. I agree with um, Dan that we're looking at the, at the longer term gear. Um, we're looking at a 30 year time horizon and then revising the IMO's greenhouse gas strategy um, in 2023 um, is when we will agree to the revised strategy. And so, um, I mean, I, I think it's just important to, to note that um, there's still a need to get to zero emissions and to actually get to, to truly zero emission vessels. And as Jason was saying in the beginning, um, th this is really the first year where you need to have a ship that is capable of being zero emissions sometime in its lifetime. And so that's, that's not going to change. Great. Jason, anything you'd like to add? Um, I, given that there's a minute left, I think I'll leave it there. Perfect. Well, thank you all so much for being with us. I really just want to thank uh, Jason, Dan, and Brian for, for taking the time to be here. Um, Jason and Climate Works, thank you for hosting. Everyone will be sending out an email tomorrow um, with ways to get engaged, but just to say this is a, this is a, a, a fight and an opportunity for the months and years and decades to come. Um, to get ships off fossil fuels. And we really appreciate your support. We're looking forward to your ideas um, and wish you all a, a, an energetic uh, Earth Day. There are many, many days ahead of more online rallies and events. Um, so hopefully we'll see you on some of those. Um, and just thank you all so much. Thanks, Beth.